Welcome to another online Hustlers meetup. Uh, as always, it's great to see so many people joining from all over the globe. Uh, Jasper has been a member of the Zurich Haskell community for a long time and has been organizing Zurich for a long time. Today he'll be speaking about organizing a Haskell conference and share his experience with us. Uh, if you have any questions, please share them on Slack. Um, with that, over to you, Jasper. Sorry, I wasn't mute. So hi everyone, um, so I'm Jasper. Uh, I'm a long time Haskell user, both for fun. So that means open source projects, kind of like spare time projects in general, um, as well as for profit. I've been professionally using Haskell for a long time uh, as well now. Um, and I org also organize hackathons. So I organized one in Belgium a really long time ago, uh, like around 10 years ago, actually. Um, and then, um, yeah, since I think in the last five years or something, I've been involved uh, with the organization of Zurich, becoming one of the main organizers um, maybe three or four years ago. Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk um, about a bunch of things. Um, I'm going to give a brief history of the evolution of the Haskell Hackathon. Um, we have special guest Don Stewart joining us as well. He's one of the early Haskell Hackathon pioneers. Um, so we're going to do a quick interview with him and talk about uh, the, in the early days, really. Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk a bit uh, about how to organize uh, a hackathon, mainly from a Zuri hack perspective, of course. Um, so hopefully, maybe you can get some uh, inspiration if you want to organize a hackathon yourself. And so feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have a question. Um, maybe the easiest way to do that is you just post them on the Slack channel, and then uh, Andreas can forward them uh, to me. But yeah, I'm open to any questions at any points, really. Um, so yeah. Let's start. Um, let's talk about the history of Haskell Hackathon. So what's a Haskell Hackathon? Um, there's a bunch of community events in, uh, in the Haskell world. There's, of course, the uh, academic conferences. ICFP is undoubtedly the most well-known one. Um, but there's others as well, like there's a big Haskell presentation um, or like Haskell presence usually at Popol. Um, and there, there's more. There's non-academic conferences as well. Uh, for example, the Haskell Exchange. Uh, there's the Haskell Love, a very recent conference. Uh, there's one in Belarus. Um, there's Compose Conference. Some of these are commercial. Some of these are free conferences. Some of them are online. Others are real life events. Um, another place where you can see um, Haskell is in real life is, of course, meetups. Uh, there's Haskell meetups in a bunch of big cities. Um, I'm obviously an active member of the, of the Zurich one, um, but yeah all over where there's like a large population of programmers, you'll probably find FP or Haskell meetups. Um, but then apart from these things, I think hackathons are really uh, like a separate thing that doesn't don't really fit into uh, one of these categories. Um, if you've ever read the, the website of any sort of hackathon, uh, there's a big chance you've seen this uh, snippet. Um, it says that it sort of tries to define uh, a hackathon and introduce it to the reader. It's an international grassroots collaborative coding festival with a simple focus, build and improve Haskell libraries, tools, and infrastructure, and so on. Um, I don't know who the original author of the snippet is. Maybe we can ask Don later. Um, but it seems to be a paragraph that's basically copied then slightly modified and pasted on almost uh, every single hackathon uh, Wikipedia page or website. Um, but anyway, I think it defines the spirit and um, the goal of a Haskell hackathon kind of well. Um, and I, I would say the only thing I'd like to add is if you talk to people at hackathons um, and you ask them what they think of it, it always kind of like comes back that they find the community aspect really the most uh, important of it. So I think that that bit is um, maybe a bit missing here. Uh, these paragraphs are maybe a bit more towards the technical side of things. Um, so I would maybe define a Haskell Hackathon as the ultimate Haskell community event. Um, it's not like a meet meetup like this one where you have a single or maybe a few speakers. Um, it's really an event for everyone. Um, and this is maybe kind of slightly different from how it all started. Um, I believe when it started out, there was really more of a need um, rather than people organizing hackathons just because they like it. Um, because the Haskell community back then, um, well, they needed modern libraries, they needed the package manager and so on. Whereas now we're still contributing to these things, of course. Um, but for many people, the prime reason is to, to go to Haskell hackathon is really um, just to meet with people they know and people they, they want to see again and get to know uh, new people. 
Um, so that also leads us to the question of why we, we, we bother organizing Haskell hackathons. Um, and from what I said before, at least for now, I think it's really uh, about the community. Um, there's a bunch of people using Haskell, uh, obviously, but there's also a bunch of people using the Phillips screwdriver, right? And they don't seem to organize Phillips screwdriver hackathons. Um, there's also, on the other side, there's also a bunch of people using Python, um, but also they don't seem to organize these, uh, these big ha hackathons um, for like the Python community. Although there are, uh, of course, um, hackathons for specific uh, Python projects. Um, so one thing we can ask ourselves is really what sets the Haskell community apart and why do we, do we bother uh, doing this? Maybe it's the size. Um, the Haskell adoption has grown over the years for sure. I'm still organizing hackathons. Um, can hackathons get too big? I'm not sure because the thing is you really have a geographical uh, distribution of Haskellers. And as we'll get more people using Haskell and maybe in an ideal world, uh, people wisen up and we literally have like millions of Haskellers everywhere. Maybe then instead of having Zurich hack, we would have a Zurich Christ fear uh, hackathon and you would just get like more very local ones. Um, so I don't really think the size of the community has uh, a, lot of, a lot to do with it. Um, I think it's more useful to look, like if you look toward project specific hackathons, um, you can, for example, see a bunch of people going to a NumPy hackathon. I'm, not, I'm actually not sure if a NumPy hackathon exists, um, but what those people, what kind of binds those people together is they have a common interest, an interest in scientific computing in the case of NumPy. Um, so it's about maybe a shared interest. And I think the same can be said uh, about the Haskell community. People are interested in, I think, generally making programming better, uh, more correct, easier, um, by better, having better languages, um, having better type systems, having better tools. That's also presumably why the reason why there's such a big overlap with the Haskell community and the Nix community. So I think it's not just like a, like a Phillips screwdriver, like a tool that people use. Um, it's more about having this tool uh, that people want to improve. Um, and it's sort of organized by people who use this tool and it's a community of people who are interested in improving tools. Um, so I think that's really the why we, we bother with all of this. Um, and so if I look at myself, I guess a bunch of my really close friends, I also met through uh, Haskell. Um, and otherwise also people I meet at hackathons are very cool. So I think there's, I think the sort of the common interest thing is a uh, plays a big uh, factor there. Anyway, I think that's a bit uh, long winded, um, but it sort of explains my thinking about why we we bother having uh, Haskell hackathons, um, like around the language as like a general thing, as opposed to doing them uh, for a specific project. Um, so let's back go back to the history of hackathons for a bit. This is the announcement of the uh, very first hackathon, Hack 2007. Um, which was, at the, I think, um, organized sort of like just after ICFP maybe, so people could attend. Um, this, um, and it was sent to, I think the initial announcement was sent to Haskell Cafe. Uh, Haskell Cafe is kind of like a more um, informal mailing list compared to the, the main Haskell mailing list. Um, Can you see this picture? For me, it's blank. Okay, let me quickly switch terminals in that case. I think it, this seemed to work fine before, um, but maybe the issue is with um, the Zoom uh, screen sharing. Um, so just give me one second. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing and share a different screen. This seems to be a persistent issue. Let me try once more.
hopefully third one is the charm. Oh, and here we go. I guess good old X term is still working nicely. Um, is this font size still big enough though? Maybe if I resize the window a bit like this. Um, yeah, I think this is better, yeah. Okay, maybe make it a bit bigger still, okay. Um, but now the picture is gone again. Okay, I'll need to figure, um, let me just open a second window. Okay, and then I'll just have to switch screens a little bit. That is fine. Uh, all right, so here we see, uh, finally, sorry for the, the technical issues. Um, so you should be able to see a, a group picture of the very first Hecata now. Um, maybe you can recognize uh, a few faces. Um, there's um, obviously, um, Ian, Duncan, and Don, um, the organizers of the first hackathon. Uh, you can find them in the in the first row here. Um, you can also recognize maybe Simon Marlowe in the back right. Um, and on the back left, we have a very uh, young looking um, Neil Mitchell right here. Um, of course, this is not a, a big group of, of people. Probably back then, we could all fit uh, around two or three tables. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, so we can contrast that with a more recent group picture. Um, unfortunately, we don't really take a group picture at Zurihack. Maybe that's something uh, we should pick up. But here's a group picture uh, from Munihack 2019 in Munich. Um, you can see that the crowd got kind of bigger, of course. Um, and another really interesting tidbit is that also that um, Duncan is in both pictures, um, but he's, he's kind of too harder to spot in here. It's kind of fine, Duncan. I, I believe he's here somewhere. I'm not sure if you see my cursor on screen. Um, so anyway, let me go back to my slides. We can see this cursor. Um, so after the first hackathon, I think um, it goes to kind of like, an, uh, like a traveling circus kind of thing. Um, so back then, it seems like there was a big difference in how this was organized. Now you have, for example, Bayhack and Zurihack and Unihack. Um, but at the start, it seems like it was more like of a sort of traveling uh, thing. Um, and this was mostly always done by the same organizers, so Duncan, Ian, and Don. And they would work together with uh, some local organizers, I think, at, at most points. Um, and then the local organizers could help them find a building and so on. Um, so the hackathons weren't really named after the locations. Um, and yeah, it was like a traveling circus, but, but uh, a classy one like Cirque du Soleil. Um, and then it seems that the tradition of naming hackathons after the place really started with uh, Hack PDX in, uh, in Portland. Um, PDX being the airport code for the, the airport over there. Um, this is a list of all the hackathons I've been able to dig up. Um, I found most details spread around the Haskell wiki and a bunch of websites um, and a bunch of Google searches. It's not really super categorized. So this actually took <laughs> some manual um, data extraction time and I ended up writing like a thousand line YAML file or something. Um, I'll see if I can make this uh, open source together with like the rest of the slides. Um, so maybe there's some fun, fun things you can do with that. Um, so anyway, if you have a thousand line YAML file, there's only one thing uh, you can do. You spin up uh, a Hadoop cluster uh, and start uh, the big data extraction. Um, so we have this graph of hackathons over the years. Um, I don't think there's that much uh, to see here. Um, of course, the, the very f in 2006, there was only a single uh, hackathon. So the, it, it's just uh, corresponding to the size. Um, there's not much to see here. There's a slight upward trend, I would say. There's a slight dent in 2019, 
Um, and that's just because Bayhack uh, didn't happen that year, unfortunately. I suspect the the bar for 2020 will actually be larger than this um, because we're still kind of halfway the year and there's at least Muni Hack uh, still planned and I think maybe Bay Hack as well. Um, oh, so now I wanted to share an image. So I will need to jump back to the other window. So here we have a geographical uh, density plot. Um, we're doing real uh, data science here. Um, again, there's not much to see here. We can see uh, Europe and sort of the major population centers in North America light up. Um, there's not that many hackathons on other continents though. Hopefully we can improve that at some point. Um, it may look intimidating to organize a hackathon, um, but really you can start small and that way it doesn't take a huge effort. Maybe you wonder if there's enough Haskellers around. And I think the answer may surprise you if you don't uh, already have a local FP meetup. Um, other than otherwise, maybe a local FP meetup is a, a good place to start. Um, but like my good colleague Machek once said, uh, that Haskell developers are like cockroaches. Uh, you don't think they are anywhere you live, but then you find one and two, and soon it turns out there's many more. Um, so I think whenever you have a big technical culture, there's bound to be a lot of people interested in Haskellers uh, around. Um, and besides, if the location is cool, I'm sure a bunch of Haskellers from around uh, the globe would consider traveling there um, to join uh, your hackathon. Um, so let me stop sharing uh, this window again. Um, yeah, so now uh, I think we can switch over to uh, our special guest, Don Stewart. Um, Don is really a hackathon pioneer uh, since he attended and also organized most of the early hackathons and it was really uh, all over the place in Europe um, as well as in the US. Um, so Don, if you're up for it, uh, I hope you're doing okay today. Yeah, yeah, thanks everybody. It's great to join. There's um, a, lot, a lot of memories from that photo. I, I remember yeah. how cold it was in Oxford in January. <laughs> um, yeah, so Thank you a lot for, uh, for joining us. Um, and I have some uh, questions for you. Um, so maybe we can talk through the, the early history of hackathons uh, and maybe the future as well a bit. Um, so can you tell us a bit more about how all of this started? Yeah, yeah. So we, if you think that the community for a long time was funded researchers in, in like the 1990s, it was basically postdocs doing compiler research. By the 2000s though, we had the IRC channel particularly around 2001, Shea Arison started at the Haskell IRC channel. And a new community was forming that wasn't um, defined by research projects. It was defined by interest, interest in language in the ecosystem. And it was still mostly uh, students, like master's degree students and PhD students and postdocs, but they weren't working on their theses. You know, they were working on tooling and, the, and stuff hacking, having fun, collaborating. And, they're starting to, and it was starting to feel like a community, right? 100, 200 people. Uh, we had a bit of common infrastructure in um, early stuff like Cabal, right? So Isaac Potosny Jones had written Cabal and it was sort of off and running. And we, we had this first uh, blossoming of tools that weren't part of the original compiler and core library. And these things were useful. And we started to see, okay, we can build things like this now. We, we can go and off, we, we could, we, which at the time we were very worried about things like Ruby and other, other languages going so quickly and growing so quickly. How could we replicate that? And so this was just chatter on the ISC channel. The, the, the challenge was geographical distribution. People were, very few people were doing house school full time or part time. Right. There's almost, there were almost no jobs at that point. There was a little bit of work at Gawa. There was a little bit here and there, very few. You had probably had five or six people full-time working on Haskell stuff. Um, Microsoft research was really, really important for that incubation period because of that long-term funding of, of, of the two Simons. It allowed a lot of things to flourish. But other than that, we were piecing together an ecosystem of tools through volunteer efforts, typically tied to language research. Uh, but it was little groups, so Gothenburg, you know, that list of first hackathons, they're tied to ICFP locations, which are tied to typically to functional programming research groups that had two or three people, uh, students locally who were willing to organize. So that was the, the original idea was, um, why don't we get together? Um, particularly, I, I was basically on my own in a, in a research group in Sydney, trying to collaborate with people mostly in Europe, uh, a little bit in the, in the West Coast. And so I was feeling very much the geographical uh, boundary. I, I could, couldn't really travel, uh, it was very expensive. So 
we, hook, we arrange to hook up hackathons roughly to the ICFP and pop org schedules. So if you, if you look at the dates, they match and they tend to be either co-located or just before. The very first one that worked really with the GHC hackathon in Portland ICFP, which was the final day just GHC committers got together to meet and do a little bit of work. Um, and from that, we thought, okay, well, this, this kind of works. So let's do a tooling and infrastructure hackathon where the core infra people, so people who are actively contributing to general purpose Haskell infrastructure at the time would meet uh, together as a team. And uh, we were really trying to build teams out of, out of volunteers, right? So volunteers are contributing, it's open source. So everyone can do, you do, you do a little bit of work here and there, but it's hard to form a group of four or five people to build something significant. You need roadmaps and plans and milestones. And to do that, we had to get bonding and, and like interpersonal cohesion. And uh, conferences were good for that, and hence the hackathons occurred. So the first one was at the Oxford, um, at the Com Lab. Uh, we had Ian and Duncan were able to organise the, the space, right? It was basically get a room was the first requirement. Um, it was very, very minimal. It was basically find a room, a, a, a kettle, <laughs> um, a way to get uh, you know tea and coffee to get people going, and then nearby cheap accommodation because these were mostly students at the time looking for you know bunks and yeah. things like that. Um, and then a few of the, you know, international PhD students like myself flying in to go to Popple uh, and taking a little detour out of Heathrow. Uh, that's literally how, how the first one happened. So we, we wanted to really use that time valuably because it, yeah. it, was, it was a valuable time and it was very hard to get people together. So we would, we, hence all of that initial planning, you can see there was a list of projects. Uh, we asked people to do prep ahead of time to make sure they could just turn up you know, 9am on the first day, open the laptop, you're ready to go. GHC is installed, you've got the latest copy of everything, you know it all builds, you don't want to, you don't want to waste the first half day uh, playing with tooling issues just to get going. And then there were initial project ideas. So we, we really needed to get from a compiler and um, you always write everything from scratch, a bit like you know, C, yeah. that's kind of how we were. We had GHC and you would write everything from scratch using FB tools. Instead, we needed a package manager, uh, we had Cabal, which was good for building. We needed, but we needed to land, download, distribute packages, do versioning, uh, and to do that, we had to build the network library. The HTTP library had to be updated, and we needed to run Hackage, the service. That was the very first thing. We had a, a read-only copy of Hackage going into the first hackathon, and we had these goals to get uploads, authentication, uh, a few other things working. And we basically did that in that first hackathon over those two days. Um, I remember Beyond Bring It was drawing on the whiteboard. We were describing things like. Um, you know, Cabal get that we would just, that's where we had the idea that Cabal would be somehow tied to Hackage. The build system and the package distribution system were going to be connected. And we were very much influenced by Darks at the time, so Darks command model. Um, and you can see this now, reflecting things like Cargo over in the Rust community. Cargo and Cabal, uh, they're so similar in, in how that tooling has inherited, where you have a single command for your ecosystem um, that it hooks together versioning, uploads, distribution, and lowers the barrier to entry to contribute. And we were really interested in that, lowering the barrier to entry to contribute, making it easier, documenting our stuff. Um, and so that was that was the goal of the first one. So it was a very technical hackathon with a very specific goal of bootstrapping the open source community from the research community. And then they they rapidly got bigger. The, those first couple of ones, the ones I really remember are Freiburg, um, Gothenburg, Philly, and and the Oxford ones, where we really would there was like a core group of about twelve to fifteen people that were already actively working, already knew each other over IC yeah. and were working on specific projects. But then it very quickly got bigger. I remember being shocked the very first Zuri hack. So um, Johan Tibble organized that with Google. And so yeah. first step one, it's not a university, it was a corporate sponsor. And so there was beer, there was there was food, it was amazing. <laughs> this felt like such a breakthrough. And uh, I think I'm trying to remember how many people we had, but I, I'm sure we had something like 50 to 60, maybe more yeah, at the very first series. I think like around big. 60 people were the first series hack here in 2010. Yeah. Yeah. 10, yeah. And so that was a that was a sea change because it went from uh, essentially a core contributors uh, project meeting where we were trying to unblock ourselves and then we'd go our separate ways and continue working to more of a growth story. We were bringing new yeah. people into the community through the hackathon. And so my role changed very much by 2010. I was doing mentorship at these hackathons. I'd be yeah. walking around tables, connecting people to each other and unblocking them on projects and suggesting project ideas, just being a source of project ideas for somebody, uh, for the group. Uh, often the first thing on the first day would be write down a list of useful things you could contribute to if you know nothing 
other than how to you know compile the Haskell a Haskell program. Yeah. Uh, and so that was the, that was the big shift I think from the early stage to the, the middle stage of mm. scaling the community. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so you mentioned um, getting Hackage done at one of the very first uh, hackathons. Um, there's been a bunch of other uh, Haskell projects started at hackathons, and you were involved in a lot of these. Um, are there any other achievements you are particularly proud of? I def definitely that first, those key things like getting Hackage upload to work. <laughs> so we had a place to share. So you remember the, the environment we came from, there was no corporate sponsorship. We didn't have servers. Yeah. And so it worked because of distributed version control. We, we went big on darks very, very early. Um, well before Git was around, I remember on an international flight, sharing a commit, but a Haskell commit between two seats using an Ethernet cable <laughs> um, over darks to synchronize a repo. And it, this was a, a, astonishing, right? Because there's no internet or anything on the planet at this time. So we were distributed. Everything had to be very distributed, very, very cheap, uh, decentralized because of the nature of our economic model. Yeah. Um, and so that led to that early innovation. Um, other things, I think, particularly Cabal work, containers was a great one. I remember uh, Johan Tibble and I spent two days in, was it in Zurich? I think it was, in Zurich. it was the same week that Welltyped was founded. I remember we watched the signing of the documents. So, oh. we, but we worked on containers and we had this, we basically wanted to revise the containers library and we could make it about four times faster um, with two or three days work, just solid work. We work at the plan then go through and refactor the whole thing. And so those, those um, specific, it was almost like specific project deliverables that we plan to do in a very intense period. Um, those were great and memorable, but I think the other, the other side of it is the relationships that you know, ten years later, like yes, I remember. I remember Ghent, right? That, that was a that yeah. was a great um, that was a great one as well. <laughs> Walking <laughs> in the rain up through the, the cobblestones and eating the yeah. eating the candies, and um, but it was a community, right? It's a community that formed out of that. You have relationships a decade or fifteen years later, twenty years later, um, based on that shared trust that you worked together. You're essentially, you were colleagues during that hackathon period. Yeah. Um, yeah. So as you told before, I imagine the the first hackathons were probably quite chaotic do you have any other like favorite crazy stories or like people working through the night or like things like that that you remember well i remember we, people were often jet lagged right so we were doing yeah. non-local hackathons so people were jet lagged which was always a challenge yeah. a lot a lot of coffee um <laughs> huge amounts of coffee and people were getting quite a huge amount of energy and then we'd all fade really fast around seven o'clock at night and then there would be a mad search to go and find pizza or <laughs> get any kind of beer or something so people could sleep uh, the, the nights tended to be pretty late. From the nights, though, you would have all of these discussions of the things that you right. would have today. The, you know, the, the tooling we have today um, that has influenced so many other language communities as well came out of you know, late night discussions in the, the Gothenburg student lab over where we had a case of beer. I remember Bjorn got a case of beer from Chalmers <laughs> and that was you know, a huge breakthrough. <laughs> um, I was trying to think of some of the other... I mean, the very early ones, it was like the HTTP library. So we had to get basic stuff working. And then right. around 2007, 2008, people started to get jobs. All right, so I, I looked at, for example, I went to work at Galois and I suddenly I had a full-time Haskell job and I, I was writing code for work and releasing it. And, and then it really changed. It became much more scaled in the, the ecosystem. At that yeah. point, we had multiple people writing all of the libraries you know today, you know, JSON and ByteString and um, containers and yeah. many, like many of the core libraries that have had millions and millions of users since, um, came out of that first second wave from the hackathons to, oh, we have a viable ecosystem and then we can start a company and we can actually build things. So I think that's the other thing that came out of the hackathons was um, filling enough holes in the ecosystem that it became viable to do commercial. Right. Yeah. And um, another question. So as you mentioned, you, you saw basically hackathons grow from maybe 12 people um, to probably like four or five times uh, that. And then, I guess you have this sort of like group of core contributors, um, which is maybe a bit like an in-group and then you have like new faces joining as well. Um, how, did you find it sort of easy to get all these new faces involved? Do you have any ideas about how we can make this easier? Yeah, I, well, I mean, certainly people rotated through because um, life, you know, life gets in the way and, and things like that. Right. You have, it was very clear that people had periods where you could contribute because you were funded, whether that meant work, commercial work or research work. It was very yeah. important at that time. The whole community was built on PhDs and master's students. The, you know, the schools that did extensive master's 
programmers generated lots and lots of code for us. And that really, that changed so much around 2007. So I think we had sustained multiple companies contributing libraries. So I think the, um, the in-group is, it's, it, it came from the open source contributors. So it was almost the ISC channel group and, right. um, but then tied to people that would travel for research. So there was a bit of a mix of, it's a, the research oriented open source folks. Yeah. Um, the cast of characters that changed probably every two or three years based on who was who was able to contribute. Like I didn't know Yasper yeah. at the start of the day, uh, when this stuff happened, but then and you, people would turn up and organize a hackathon, you get to know them. Um, but, so the key there was barrier to entry. So how to bootstrap somebody to senior contributor, right? Yeah. You've got lots of people who were dabbling on Saturdays and Sundays. You need to get them into sort of professional senior contributor mode where they know the whole ecosystem, they know how it fits together, and they've got sense in how to build. And that's why we started doing things like writing books, doing yeah. podcasts, doing videos. I, and I really tried to move from local grassroots organizing to um, online distributed uh, around the same time we started like the house for reddit was a big shift to move people off email because that was a again another barrier to entry um you could broadcast a message to hundreds of people and you would find a few more key contributors so it was really a, a growth hacking mode where we were well, i was personally writing a lot of documentation a lot of early tutorials how to get started and then ramping up very quickly into you know type level programming and distributed concurrent programming um, so I think that's all still the case, right? You, yeah. If you have a new area, you, you want to find good talent by making it very accessible to get to your hackathons, really welcome new people. Uh, that, that was a big part of my job was to just meet people and get to know them, make sure you knew the names of everybody. And that was a good tip in the early hackathons. We used to try to memorize everyone's names, like a, a little ice breaking oh, yeah. activity. If you don't can't do that, make sure there's stickers or something. So. Because not you know not everybody is social and gregarious. It's lots of different personality types, lots of different languages and cultural backgrounds. So break down getting to know people, and you'll find connections between people, and then those people will feel safe and secure and become your core contributors in the future. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, do you have any other advice for people who would like to organize uh, a Haskell hackathon in a location that we haven't had one before? I think you you're sort of hinting at it. It's it can start really small, right? right. We got yeah. so much value out of small groups in a single city with 10 to 20 people. I remember a dark hackathon. So we said we did a spin off one in Portland, a dark hackathon with about eight people. And that was still very valuable. You got to know people, you contributed right. and did things. So I think go for a bit like a meetup, look at, use your meetup community to see who's willing to, like who would enjoy it's, it's driven by passion and like you just love to hack and you can't imagine anything better on a weekend than getting together and hacking find, find eight to ten people set some clear goals try to build something try to create something uh, we, we used to like duncan and i used to joke about it, it's a bit like a band we were doing like new records you know new releases <laughs> were with new project ideas because you could build anything it's a matter of working out what's the best thing to build um and so there'd be a lot of just sort of you know, lying sitting in a chair brainstorming you know what what's our new material what would we do next um yep. and i think that's a bit of it so don't just dive in try to indoctrinate and build a little group who work well together and start small don't don't go for a hundred person hackathon up front start a small group targeted project yeah um so lately you've been less active in the hassle community so i suppose live is keeping you busy um do you still have uh, spare time hacking projects or all the things that we would enjoy that you want to tell us about <laughs> Yeah, I guess I've, it's, I sort of made an intentional decision around 2011. So I've, I've, I've worked at Galois for four years doing, you know, building systems, generating a lot of open source on the, as a side result. Um, and, we, and we finished Real World Haskell as well. And so things were really taking off with the community. And I was able to, I sort of consciously stepped back at that time to focus on work. I switched jobs. I moved to New York to start the, the Standard Chartered Strats team, which was building Haskell trading, trading systems with Neil Mitchell and uh, Roman Lashinsky and a few others. And we, we built this, so I had to, I, like, uh, at first consciously, I had to switch industries and learn a new discipline. And so I basically had to stop working on the open source things. And now, of course, I work at Facebook. I'm writing Haskell again. I'm part of the um, the code indexing team here. That okay. builds builds a um, it's an in memory database for indexing code and making it searchable. Very you know, so you can query query all of the code from your IDE uh, very quickly. That kind of model. Again, it's written in Haskell, but we do lots of different things. So I think how I was thinking a bit about this question. So you watch for burnout. I certainly worked 
I put about 10 years, seven days a week into growing the community. I really wanted to grow and build a sustainable ecosystem around some really solid tech. That's very, very hard and it, it, it's, you're making trade-offs in your life. Um, by the time I was about 35, I wanted to think about my family. I've, I've got young kids now, so I don't, I don't hack on the weekends very much. I do a little bit. I wrote, I like, I was actually been writing a bit of Rust and playing with that recently. It's sort of the, if you go look at some of the byte string code from 2007, it looks a lot like Rust code. Um, so it's, it's a bit of that, particularly trying to learn more systems programming stuff, low level stuff. There have been, you know, improvements in, in kernels and devices lead to new improvements in programming language abstractions. But that layer between systems programming has always been very interesting to me. So I do a little bit of that, but I would actually say, you know, work life balance starts to matter. Um, yep. learning things outside of work starts to matter and having, having a more of a sustainable path. Um, I, I don't think I could keep doing, like you saw the, the amount of travel that was involved in that, that yeah. 2005 to 2010 period was, was pretty intense and I was always tired. <laughs> but now, now, now I'm enjoying, that. I'm and enjoying also writing a book on the site. <laughs> well, yeah, I was doing my PhD thesis and writing a book on the site. So it was definitely, and, and I changed countries to my work at Gala. So, it was definitely uh, don't overcommit too much, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> or if you do, make it a short window. Um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm not sure if there's any other questions uh, from the participants for Don while we have him. Uh, you're obviously welcome to stick around for the rest of the talk, uh, Don. Uh, I'm just going to talk a bit more uh, about sort of like practically organizing a hackathon. Um, but maybe sure. if there's questions for for Don, we can answer those first. Yeah, thanks so much, Jasper. The I would say a lot of the stuff is on the wiki. So, you know, we were good yeah. in getting a media wiki up early and, and trying to document everything. So those photos, the early plans, I think there's a bit of a how-to in there, really basics. Right. Um, you know, bring cables for people. If you're the organizer, make sure there's enough power sockets. Um, make sure the Wi-Fi works. Test a few things out beforehand. So some of the basics of event management, we had to discover the hard way. Um, and, then, and then share back. So what you learn, how, you know, whether your hackathon was successful, write it up and share it back to the community. This constant process of, of learning something and sharing it back is how we all grow. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's hopefully what we're doing with this, with this talk. Uh, so thank you again for joining us. And um, I'm going to continue uh, talking about now about um, practically organizing uh, a hackathon and uh, sort of the things you can do. Um, so let me share my screen again. Um, so what do you need to organize uh, a hackathon? Well, really the most important um, part is you need to, you need a location. Um, since most hackathons are a pri like a, a free event, you can't really pay to hire a location, of course, um, but there are solutions and we'll, we'll talk about it uh, for a bit. You need a table and some chairs to seat has colors on and you need Wi-Fi, of course. Um, and then other than that, really the only thing you need is um, a nice website or a wiki page so people can find all the information. And that basically gives you everything you need to, to get started with a, with a smaller uh, hackathon. Um, let me jump back to my other share. So here we go. Um, so you need to find a building. And if you look at the hackathons that have been organized in the past. Um, can you see my slides, by the way? I'm not sure if I did that correctly. Uh, yes, we can see them. Okay, perfect. Um, so there's basically two options. Uh, there's universities uh, and there's companies. Um, since, um, yeah, both of these work pretty well. Um, I think in both cases, you kind of need an ambassador. Um, so for example, a PhD student or a professor uh, who you know at a university, or a Haskeller working at a company, or maybe one of the organizing committee is, is working at a company that's willing to um, to give their offices for the weekend um, for some for some Haskell hacking. Um, for I think for a university, it's good PR. Um, Haskell has an advantage there since it's somewhat considered uh, a language connected to academia, um, so it can be a bit. Uh, prestigious for university to organize Haskell uh, events. And for a company, they're often in, interested in uh, recruiting people and organizing a hackathon is a very good uh, opportunity to recruit people. Um, and even if they're not actively using uh, Haskell, maybe companies realize that the Haskell community is full of bright people. Um, so they want to try and, and hire there. Um, so yeah, 
what do you do? It's nice to have some uh, dates set when you're organizing a hackathon. And we have a little bit of a, of a playbook uh, like that for Zuri Hack. And I'll also try to, to mention that in, this, uh, in these slides a bit. Um, so yeah, you have a building, you have a set of dates. Um, so then you start, other, you start to set other dates. Uh, depends on the stuff you want to organize, of course. Um, you want to keep into account that possible attendees need to have like, enough time to plan the trip. Um, maybe there's other things like you want to invite speakers or do a call for presentation, um, and you need to wait a bit for that for results to come in. Um, but um, yeah, it's really up to you. And throughout the rest of the presentation, I'll sort of try to mention when we do things for Zuri Hack. Um, but if I forget to include that, just uh, ask me. Um, so for Zuri Hack, what we do around nine or 10 months in advance as we set up a committee. Um, it doesn't really have to be a, a formal committee. It can just be a bunch of friends or you and a colleague um, or you and another student or something like that. Um, so usually we have a meeting around the end of August, maybe begin September, which reminds me we should really set it up for this year. Um, anyway, we sort of invite the people from last year, maybe any new faces. Um, usually this is people who we've gotten to know over the year uh, by way of the Zurich ASCO meetup. Um, and they said they're interested in has helping with Zurihack. So then we kind of like remember their contact info um, and we try to invite them to the initial meeting. So we get together and we see who's interested in doing what. There's a bunch of responsibilities. Uh, what we have right now is things like website, the t-shirts, the speakers, uh, the location, there's registration, there's sponsors, there's food. Um, there's obviously helping at the event itself. Um, a lot of things, a lot of these things overlap though. So it's, if you're keeping things small, it's possible for one or two people uh, to basically cover uh, every, all of this. Um, so then the next thing after that initial meeting, what we try to do is we try to build a website. Um, I kind of consider the website as the single source of truth. Initially, it's just a static page uh, with the location at that time, of course, because also you don't know that much information at that time. If we already have a speaker, we'll put it there as well. Um, and then as we get closer to the event and we figure out um, more things, we'll try to update the website uh, to sync with that. Um, obviously, you can't put everything there. You need some things that are still up in the air, uh, for example, speakers that you've contacted but that aren't uh, confirmed yet. So we have a second source of truth in a Google Doc that's shared uh, with all organizers. Um, this works pretty well, I think, and um, the both the website and the Google Doc kind of give you a template for next year, just copy the one from last year uh, and you start from there. Um, what's the next thing to organize? So there's speakers. Um, I think as I've said before, like the community is aspects um, are definitely more important um, than the talks and the speakers, um, but it's still something very valuable. Um, aside, of course, from being very interesting and like a nice break from hacking on things, you can watch an interesting talk. Um, I think speakers are a good tool to attract people to your event. Maybe people aren't really using Haskell right now, but they're familiar with the blog of, um, for example, like Alexis King or Gabriel Gonzalez, or maybe they've heard the name Simon Peyton Jones before. Um, and so they see that we have cool speakers and decide to attend. Um, and so that's an awesome way to get new people. And then aside from enjoying the, the talks, um, they can maybe join the community that way. Um, to get speakers for your event, I think there's basically two ways. You can either do a call for proposals uh, or you can just invite people directly. Um, a call for proposals is where people send in uh, possible uh, proposals and you just uh, pick some. What we've done for Zurihack in the past is just inviting people directly. Um, there are a lot of interesting speakers in the Haskell community and a lot of them are uh, really like traveling and giving a talk. So that's awesome. Um, unfortunately, I think we're still missing a bunch of speakers because not everyone can afford to take time off to prepare a talk. Uh, this takes a lot of time and you have to travel as well, of course. Um, and ideally most events should be paying speakers, but that's not really feasible for free events. Maybe in the future, if we have significantly more funding, uh, this would be possible. But anyway, in the last few years, we've been able to at least pay for flights and accommodation for Zuri Hack speakers. So I think that's something to be to be proud of. Um, for a new conferences, this is of course not always possible. Um, but you should 
still be able to get good speakers. I think either local ones or uh, people in the Haskell community willing to travel. And obviously you don't need speakers. For example, we had a small uh, hackathon in Bristol in January or February, I think, and it was didn't have any speakers and it was perfectly fine. It was just more of a focus on hacking. Um, so one last note about speakers is we usually start looking for speakers in September, but we don't really try to find all we have five speakers usually at Zurich. We don't try to find all of them at that point. Um, we just have one or two and then add more throughout the year. Um, that way you, you also get an extra opportunity to um, advertise again, for example, on Twitter, like where you announce, oh, we, we've added this or that speaker uh, to our lineup. Um, and that kind of gives you an opportunity to be in the, in the spotlight again. Um, then around six months before the event, we try to open registration. It's usually around New Year, year for Zuri Hack, um, and we keep the registration open until the event or when it gets full, um, because people who live close by should be able to basically register on the last day. Um, for registration, you don't really need anything fancy. I think the earliest ones just um, you just add your name to a wiki page. Um, for Zuri Hack, we had a Google form that you had to fill in, and then got that got uh, added to a spreadsheet. Um, and then we would add everyone to a mailing list and send them announcements uh, that way. This is kind of a bit of manual work though. Um, we did this for maybe up to 200 people, um, but like with limited Excel skills, this was getting very tedious. Um, and now we have a better system and I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, so together with registration, there are uh, the Haskell project, uh, of course. A hackathon is mostly about uh, the project. Um, and it kind of like defines what people are going to work um, on. Um, our registration usually has an entry for projects. That way you can get an initial list online of things that people want to work on. Um, obviously not everyone will fill this in yet, uh, but that's fine. We also have uh, our website on GitHub and other hackathons have a wiki page. So people can really just edit it at any point if they want to add uh, projects. Um, I think it's quite valuable to have the look of uh, projects online before the hackathon um, because people can have a look at what they find interesting. And then if you like a particular project, you kind of feel like you have somewhere to go when you arrive. Um, and that's kind of nice when you arrive at a new, new place. Um, I definitely like this when I was uh, attending hackathons. Um, so then at the event itself, we also give a quick chance for people to present what they're working on, um, like an elevator pitch, either a minute or uh, 30 seconds. You don't want to keep people occupied for too long because they, they've just arrived and they want to get uh, started hacking. And as a sort of dual to the project pitches, what we usually do at the end is uh, project presentations um, where people can show basically what they've worked on for the weekend. Uh, that's always very motivating to see, especially when people have made contributions to core things like GEC, or sometimes there's demos with very interesting uh, visuals and so on. Um, so then there's sponsors. Um, you don't really need sponsors, um, but it's kind of useful. You know, it's nice to have uh, some budget available. Um, we get sponsors by basically selling recruitment uh, opportunities. Um, so while people, uh, what the companies get in return are a bunch of things. Um, yeah, so everyone knows that hiring people is hard and um, companies are willing to spend a little bit of money to get this done. Um, for example, it's not unheard of for recruiters or headhunters to get like five digit numbers for recruiting someone. So surely companies are willing to pay a fraction of that to be able to have like a recruiting presence at a place with so many wonderful engineers. Um, so yeah, that's basically the story uh, we used to approach possible sponsors with. It works pretty well. Um, I'll discuss what we use the money for uh, in a bit. And this is kind of what we give the sponsors in return. Um, I put four months here. Um, it kind of depends. You can add sponsors at any time, but there's obviously cutoff times. Like if they want to be on the t-shirt, you want to have them confirm before you print the t-shirts, of course. Um, and it's generally good to have an ID of your budget uh, as early as possible. Um, one thing we use the sponsoring money for is a t-shirt. 
this is obviously very optional. You don't have to do this if you're just starting out with a with a conference. Um, it's kind of a high cost. Um, I'm not sure how this got started, like where the tradition where we give people T-shirts um, at the Haskell Hackathon, but it's been going for a, a, a while now. Um, and a couple of years, we reevaluated this because I wasn't sure if people really liked having or people really cared about having a free conference T-shirt. Um, but it turns out that pe do people do care a lot. Um, we asked in a post Surrey hack survey if people wanted to keep the t-shirts or people rather wanted to spend the money, like the budget on something else. And I think over 80% uh, of people said they wanted to keep the t-shirts. Um, so since then, what we've done is we've tried to make them a bit nicer. I mean, if you're spending 4K Swiss francs on t-shirts, it's also worth paying a graphic designer as well. It's like a small um, addition on top of that. And you can reuse the logo for your website and so on. Um, and if you're printing t-shirts, it's better uh, if people actually want to wear them, you know? So if we've worked with the, with the same designer for like the last two years now, and the t-shirts are very cool, as you can see. Um, so yeah, we ask for the sizes, uh, for the t-shirts and the registration, um, obviously people who register after a specific time, uh, we don't really have a t-shirt for them, but we print some spares and, uh, usually it works out. Uh, what we did the last year is we, we had people who registered before we printed the t-shirts, pick up their t-shirt on the first uh, date, um, the first day of the conference. And then if there's leftovers, people can pick up, uh, their t-shirt if they, they register too late or maybe pe people can pick up um, a second t-shirt. Um, I mean, there's always some errors because some people don't show up and some people uh, register later. Um, then there's food. Haskellers need food like anyone else. Um, there's a bunch of options always. Um, I think if you're very lucky, there's a restaurant at the location. We had that with the Google office in, uh, in Zurich where they had kind of like a cafeteria. Um, and we also, have this um, at the university where we organize it now. They have a Mensa that we can use and it's a pretty cheap option for lunch. Um, obviously, sometimes you don't have uh, those restaurants. I mean, that's not a big problem. You don't need to organize uh, food. You can just tell people to go out to restaurants. Um, I mean, going to cool restaurants is maybe half of the reason why I like to travel. So it's nice to have an opportunity to go to restaurants as well. Um, alternatively, you can get food to come. That's a bit harder. Um, and for Zuri Hack, we've had the, like a truck with a pizza oven come uh, and a ramen vendor. Um, yeah, it's a little harder to organize because you don't really know how much they will sell and they want to hear some estimates. Um, we've made some mistakes there in the past, both that people had to queue for a really long time, um, as well as where the vendor wasn't really happy with how much he sold. Um, but yeah, we're doing uh, better at that now. The last option I have in here is doing a barbecue. I think that's an amazing option. People can buy their own meat or non-meat alternatives in the supermarket and it's not super expensive. I mean, it's still expensive because it's Zurich, but it's still a lot cheaper than a restaurant. Um, and it doubles as a social event uh, as well. So you can talk with people and drink a beer. Um, so if the weather allows for it, um, I would definitely recommend organizing something like that. Um, Wow, I have an image working here for some reason. Um, this is what you get if you write your own presentation software. Um, maybe I'll, I should try that out um, in the in the future. So anyway, um, then one month in advance, we try to put uh, together the final schedule. I mean, you can always uh, make last minute changes, uh, but it's good that people have a have a rough ID beforehand. Um, this is a schedule from 2019. Um, I think the schedule probably looks kind of similar for most hackathons. There's hacking on projects, which is like the default action uh, that you kind of fill everything in with. Um, and then you have to take break for talks and food. Um, it's always nice to include some uh, social event as well. Um, that doesn't really need to be fancy. Um, I mean, in Zurich, we, we are lucky that we have this amazing lake and we could just have a beer next to the lake. Um, but you can also organize going to a pub or something like that. It doesn't have to be fancy. You just post the address of the pub and people can figure it out themselves. Um, then it's time for the event. Um, the event itself is usually 
a bit chaotic. Um, there's not much advice I can offer. Um, the only thing I can say is plan to be very busy um, and don't plan to work on too many projects uh, for yourself. Um, just plan to assist people and uh, yeah, if you've prepared everything uh, in advance, like there'll be some new stuff uh, popping out, but um, yeah, no big problems that we've had in the in the past. Um, yeah, now I wanted to talk a bit more about the registration system that we use. Um, so we had some issues with registration um, that were kind of getting really annoying for me personally, as well as other people. Um, there's a lot of manual work involved in having people register, adding them to a Google group so you can contact them, um, sort of mailing people as they can get off the waiting list if you have that. Um, there's a privacy concern as well. I'm not sure if storing people's info in like a Google Sheet is GDPR compliant, um, but it's probably not a great idea even if it is compliant. Um, there's some issues with people joining Google Groups. Do you need a Google account for that? Um, I still don't know. I've seen conflicting reports, um, but we've sort of had issues with that each year. Um, so this year, we, I think it, no, actually in 2018, we built uh, this custom thing in Haskell that had a lot of uh, advantages. Um, so first of all, it helps with the registration process and getting people off the waiting list and so on. Um, but it also did a lot of other things that were surprisingly helpful. For example, we had this uh, QR code in your ticket, um, so you could just arrive at the event and then it showed us what kind of t-shirt you ordered, like if you ordered it in time, what color uh, and so on. And this year it allowed us to kind of patch in a custom workflow where, because it was a virtual event, um, where it generated like a unique Discord code and you can just access uh, all our stuff from there. Um, so this is what it looks like. Uh, as you can see, it's also been picked up by MuniHack and they also use it for the Bristol um, hackathon. Um, if you're doing hackathon, I would recommend using it. It's pretty simple to set up if you know uh, a little bit about AWS, runs on AWS. Also, if you don't know AWS, it's still pretty easy to set up. Um, it's uh, like a single cloud formation stack, which kind of means you can bring it up and down as a single unit and there's no, you don't need to sort of worry about like resources being left around and so on. Um, I haven't really heard anyone of uh, Bristol and Munich have, having issues with it. Um, there's a few weird design choices. For example, uh, it's using AWS DynamoDB as a database, which is horrible, horrible uh, for this use case, but it's in the free tier uh, forever. And so you, if your database is small enough, and um, so that's what pushed me to use this over, over a real uh, database. Um, I'm not sure if the resolution is big enough, um, but yeah, we basically, um, so the weird thing is I got this notification this summer that a credit card charge had failed for AWS and I wasn't really sure what happened um, because I had no cards expiring or anything like that. Um, and it turned out I still had my old credit card linked to the, the AWS account and they simply don't charge you below a certain threshold. I think because the credit card fees are too high compared to the cost. So this was the first charge we've gotten in years um, from AWS. And this was in the months that Zurihack uh, happened and registration had already been open for uh, many months. And it was 16 USD cents. Um, so that's obviously very cheap. And I think we were just paying for the, like the traffic, which was um, kind of a lot. Um, so yeah, I recommend uh, using something like this. What else is there? So something we've also added um, for Zurihack uh, kind of recently is um, scholarships. So um, in the past five years, we started to see more sponsoring. And then last year, not this year, because we did a virtual event, we did scholarships as well. Um, so what does that mean? Zurihack is free, of course, um, but Switzerland is an expensive country and some people can't easily afford to travel here and pay accommodation and so on. Um, so we asked people to email us and we award scholarship. It's mostly students, um, but not necessarily limited to that, really just people who have limited financial means. Um, I think this is a very useful thing to do. Um, what else do you do with sort of the extra money, like the extra budget that you have left over, you can of course do things like making food free. Um, but really people who are working uh, can probably afford lunch, especially if we keep the prices down uh, by working with the university. So I think it's much more valuable to have um, the opportunity for more people 
to come, who otherwise wouldn't make it. Maybe three out of these 10 start contributing to Haskell open source, and maybe one of them becomes the CTO of a very large, successful Haskell company. Um, another thing we've done with Zurihack in particular is we've started a legal entity. Um, this is probably not something you need if you're just starting with a small hackathon, but it's kind of useful for more things than just the hackathon. Um, so as a hackathon gets bigger, there's money coming in, there's money going out um, that causes some headaches. Something, someone needs to be on the receipt, basically on the invoices, um, especially if you get sponsorship money from a from a conference. Um, also, someone needs to put down the money to pay for the t-shirts, and then you can reimburse it. And um, yeah, basically doing everything from personal accounts is of course not perfect. Um, maybe it's easier if you're organizing as a as a smaller company because then you already kind of have a company dealing with these invoices. Um, but yeah, so we started this association in 2018. I think especially it made it a lot easier for us to receive money from sponsors. Uh, sponsors kind of like trust um, moving money to like a, a proper organization, like a legal entity more than moving it to like a personal account. Um, and it also helped us kind of formalize the goals of what we want to achieve. Um, and it also helped us shape us up in terms of organization and get like a clear list of volunteers um, and so on. So I think this was a, was a helpful move. Um, anything else I want to say? So of course this year, uh, Zuri Hack uh, didn't happen because of obvious reasons. Um, we don't really have that many takeaways from it um, other than it was also very good. Um, we think Discord is a good platform, so we use that for the online Zuri hack, and that worked particularly well. Um, we were using Slack before at the real live event, um, but it doesn't do video chat or audio chat in the free tier, and that's kind of what you what you need for the for a virtual event. Um, and we looked into also some other platforms that also platforms that um, basically allow you to like walk around in a 2D world and kind of things like that. Um, and I think we even, I even briefly considered building something like that. Um, but it's kind of gimmicky and Discord is kind of just the features we need. Like it provides this list of video and audio channels um, right next to the text channel. So you can join people in a social hangout channel to hang out or you can join people in a project channel to work on things. And um, yeah, we had a hallway track as well where people could do spontaneous presentations. And I think that went uh, pretty well. We didn't pay anything for Discord, I don't really understand their uh, pricing model. You can boost the server as an individual user, which gives you like slightly better audio quality. Um, and I think we had one person doing that, but um, yeah, I'm not sure if it was necessary. Um, for the virtual talks, we used StreamYard, which is kind of like a broadcast studio, um, like OBS. Um, which is a big open source broadcasting studio. But I think StreamYard is kind of easier to use because it just uses the browser. Um, you can add and remove people. You can share a screen and you can add some text and video effects. Um, and that streams directly to YouTube, Twitch, and maybe even more things. Um, it only cost us $25, I think, for uh, like a monthly license, which is what we needed for Zurihack. Um, so that's really a steal. One other thing that we try to do for the virtual event is we try to sell the t-shirts online this year. Um, that went really well, well, up to a certain point. Um, we have, you can see the t-shirts are really cool um, and we sold a bunch of them. Um, but then in the end, PayPal blocked our account. So we still need to figure that out because the money is um, supposed to go to charity. So hopefully we'll have a, an update on that soon. Um, to close out, um, maybe some words about the next Zuri hack. Um, so we hope that the next Zuri hack will be able to take place in uh, real life again, as opposed to a virtual event. Um, and we can uh, already announce the dates for that as well. So we've settled on some dates um, and we'll put a website uh, up for that soon, um, but you can hear it here as a, a premiere. And we already have one really great speaker in the lineup as well. Um, so we have Emily Pilmore, uh, who couldn't make it last year, which is planning to be here in 2021. Um, and she's a Haskell library maintainer and author, and also an independent researcher interested in homotopy theory and category three. Um, so that's gonna be really cool. Um, so yeah, that's all the content I had. Um, I still have a little bit of time left for questions. Um, so yeah, thank you all for listening.
Thanks a lot, Jasper, for the great talk. Yeah, we have some time for questions. So if anyone has some questions, go ahead. Well, people are considering questions. Do you have any, I don't know, fun anecdotes to share? Any stories of things that went not as planned or anything like that? Uh, let me think. What's a, what's a good story? So I think the yeah, I'm, I'm pretty amazed by the the fact that I organized like this uh, Haskell Hackathon in 2010 because it's like it's so long ago and I was just a student at the time. Um, I was probably drunk a lot of the time as well. Um, so I'm pretty happy I was able to pull that off. Um, I remember coming to the first Siri hack as well back when, I mean, I obviously didn't live here. I was still uh, a student even younger and sort of starting um, the Blaze HTML project together with Simon, um, which then I later continued as like an open source thing um, in like Google Summer of Code. And that also that sort of like led me to um, moving to Zurich to work with Simon at Better. Um, so that's a good story as well. Um, and yeah, I think there's just uh, the best story is really how we've been able to see Zurich grow over the years, I think and still have like the same sort of, I mean, obviously this year it was a little bit different um, with the online event and everything, um, but I think it still has a lot of the original sort of community spirit. Awesome, thanks. And yeah, thanks for organizing uh, so many Zuri hacks by now. So yeah, no worries. Right. It seems that we don't have any questions coming in. Um, so thanks again, Jasper, for the great talk and sharing your experiences. I hope we'll get many more hackathons pop up um, all over the world. Yeah, I hope so too. And I look forward to, to going to them. 